Great, thank you. Um, hello everyone, my name is Mia Song. Um, like Natalie said, I am a physiatrist. My background and training is in physical medicine and rehabilitation. And I have further training in interventional spine and musculoskeletal medicine. Um, I am fairly new to Rothman and here I primarily see patients um, in non-operative spine. Um, and I'm gonna kind of get into um, my talk here, which is on low back pain. And I think it would be helpful to review some common causes of low back pain and some treatment options that are available for different issues. All right, bear with me. Let me try to figure out how to advance my slide. There we go. And I apologize, my dog is in the room. Um, he might start like, I don't know, stirring up some troubles. If you hear anything, um, that's what's going on. Um, so just an overview of what I hope to hit in this lecture. I'm gonna do a really brief overview of anatomy that's in the lumbar spine or your low back. I'm gonna go over some of the more common causes of low back pain that I see at Rothman. And then I'm gonna talk about maybe when is a good time to go see a doctor about back pain and what happens at a doctor's office visit when you're being evaluated for low back pain. I'm gonna go over different methods um, and tools that we use in diagnosing patients. And then lastly, I'm gonna hit on some treatment options available for different types of back pain. This is just kind of like an overview of a lot of different things. So I'm gonna do my best to give a good, you know, kind of, um, I guess like 30,000 foot view, but if you do have more specific questions, I'm happy to answer them at the end. So briefly, um, I'm gonna focus on the lumbar spine and your spine is made up of your cervical, thoracic, lumbar um, spine, and then at the very inferior or bottom portion here, your sacrum and coccyx. In terms of evaluating patients for lumbar or low back pain, I look in the lumbar spine, which is down here in the pink region. And it sits kind of right above your hip bones and it's flanked by the thoracic and thoracic spine and your sacrum. When we look at the anatomy here, there are five lumbar vertebrae, and I think of them as the bones or the building blocks that make up your spine. And you can see here labeled L1, L2, all the way to L5. And then they attach to your sacrum at the inferior or bottommost portion. And in between these vertebrae is where your disc sits. On the right side here, you can see the disc in kind of a pale blue gray color. And I like to think of them as supporting structures that kind of cushion um, your vertebrae and help you do different motions and activities. Um, in between each of these vertebrae, you also have the set joints, which are kind of like the knuckle joints I like to think about that um, as you move and twist, they may be involved in certain motions as well. And then kind of in the top part of this screen here is a cross section of what a vertebrae might look like. And one second. And um, what I want to point out here is that the center kind of hole here is your vertebral foramen, and that's where your spinal cord um, and your cerebral spinal fluid or your spinal fluid run through, and your nerves exit on either side through your foramen here. This is um, kind of an overview of the musculature um, in your back, and it's not comprehensive, but it gives us an idea of the multiple layers of muscles involved in stabilizing your spine and allowing you to do, to do different things like flexing or bending forward, extending backwards, twisting and turning and all that. And I'll get into some of this in more detail, but this is just kind of an overview of some of the muscles that uh, may be involved. So just to get right into it, some common causes of low back pain that I see here. Um, sorry. Um, so I'm just gonna run through some of these and then I'm gonna go in detail and explain what each one of them are. Um, sometimes pain can be due to lumbar myofascial dysfunction. You can have discogenic lumbar pain. You may have lumbar radiculopathy. There may be lumbar facet arthropathy or arthritis. Uh, patients may have lumbar stenosis, vertebral compression fractures, scoliosis, and then other causes of back pain that I don't see as commonly, maybe things like an infection, sometimes malignancy or tumors, and then sometimes uh, problems or issues that arise from the hip may refer pain into the low back, down the leg, 
um, or around your hip, which can kind of overlap with a lot of issues that we also see in um, low back pain. One sec, and my screen is, okay. Sometimes patients with fibromyalgia may also have multiple areas of pain throughout their body affecting multiple joints. And one of the areas that can be affected is your low back, your hips, your lower limbs, like your legs, your knees. And so sometimes I do also see patients with fibromyalgia who come in with, you know, a flare up of their back pain. So going over more of the common um, causes, lumbar myofascial dysfunction, I like to think of this as a dysfunction of your muscles, your fascial planes, and things that are basically not your bones or nerves directly themselves. Sometimes muscles can be hypertonic, um, and I like to think of it as, you know, muscles maybe just not relaxing when they should and not activating and relaxing in a functional pattern. For instance, when I try to explain this to patients, imagine you're lifting like a 10 pound dumbbell for 20 minutes. Your arm's gonna be pretty sore when you put that dumbbell down. And then imagine holding that dumbbell up for like two weeks. You're gonna be pretty sore and in pain after that. And that's sometimes what I like to think of it as an analogy for lumbar or low back myofascial dysfunction. You have all of these different layers of muscles that make up your back, your extensor muscles and your core that just quite aren't relaxing or firing in a normal pattern um, and eventually down the line causing pain. You can have discogenic lumbar pain and this really means that your pain is coming from your disc itself. Here in this picture, you can see the bones which are like lighter tan colored and in between the gray um, little ovals or those are your discs. And sometimes that disc itself can have a little tear or fissure or may herniate, and that can itself be very painful. Sometimes um, this happens after a specific injury or event where patients maybe lifted something, um, bent over, try to reach something off the ground. Um, and that's probably one of the more common causes of discogenic pain that I do see. Patients commonly say, you know, hey, it's really hard for me to sit down. Driving is horrible. And like when I cough, I really feel it in my back for some reason. And they may feel better when they're standing or walking around. All right. Lumbar radiculopathy. This I kind of equate to as, you know, a pinched nerve. This is when you have compression causing inflammation around some of the nerve roots that exit out of your lumbar spine. And these nerves travel down your leg and can cause pain down the leg and sometimes paresthesias or numbness and tingling down your leg as well. This can happen for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of you know, uh, different things can contribute to what may cause a nerve impingement or compression. Sometimes patients will come in and say, hey, I think this is like sciatica. I broke down sciatica here, but it's kind of a misnomer because your sciatic nerve is different from a lumbar nerve root itself. And it's pretty unusual, or I would say a lot more rare to see true sciatic nerve compression causing pain down the leg, but it can be due to compression of other nerves from your low back, like your lumbar nerve roots that may be causing pain kind of in that same distribution or area down the leg. Lumbar facet arthropathy, this is facet arthritis. So your facet joints here, and you can kind of see on the picture on the right, like again, I think that I think of them as kind of like the knuckle joints that are in between each of your vertebrae. And as you move, you bend forward and extend backwards or twist, your facet joints uh, bear some of that motion. And over time, they can become arthritic. And while arthritis itself is not a cause for pain. Sometimes it can flip over into territory where it now becomes painful. Patients uh, usually present with just pain in the low back, right where those facet joints are. And sometimes they also describe a sensation of stiffness or kind of a decreased range of motion in the low back. And this is not usually associated with pain down the legs, although sometimes there can be referred pain into the glutes or the buttocks or the hip. Lumbar stenosis. 
Stenosis refers to a narrowing of a space, and this can be stenosis in a lot of areas in your body. But when we think of lumbar stenosis, I'm referring to the vertebral foramen, which is that opening in the center of your vertebrae where your spinal canal sits. And that's where your spinal cord and your nerves and your spinal fluid are. And through a number of different processes, you know, degenerative processes or other um, etiol or other causes, you can develop stenosis or narrowing of that space, like this diagram on the right, where that opening or that foramen where your spinal cord sits gets a little bit narrowed. It can exert some pressure on your nerves. And sometimes patients describe this as pain that comes on in the back and sometimes goes down the legs. It can also uh, present in a number of ways. So patients sometimes describe a kind of a sensation of heaviness in the legs, um, maybe some trouble walking because of these symptoms. Um, and so that's also something I do commonly see. Vertebral compression fractures. Like it says, this is a fracture of one of the vertebral bodies or vertebrae in your back. This usually happens after quite a significant trauma or a fall. Um, it can be falling off a ladder a couple of feet. It can be from a car accident. Um, but sometimes patients can develop compression fractures in the absence of trauma. And usually that occurs in patients who have underlying osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a separate condition that's not necessarily related to the spine, but it's a condition where you have decreased or low bone mineral density due to a number of different processes. Sometimes it's genetic. Um, it's usually more common in older women. And there are tests that um, your primary care physician or other physicians do order to assess you for osteoporosis. But patients who have known osteoporosis can develop compression fractures without trauma, and we call them osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. Regardless, both, uh, both types of compression fractures present very similarly where patients will feel pain kind of right in the middle of their back, in their spine, at the level where they have that fracture. It's usually not associated with pain that goes down the leg or around the front or anything like that. And lastly here, I see patients who sometimes present with scoliosis and develop back pain in different patterns for one reason or another. This may be scoliosis that we call uh, idiopathic juvenile sco scoliosis, which just means it was diagnosed um, in your adolescence or when you were much younger. Um, for instance, I have a lot of patients who come in and say, you know, I had a screening test from my school nurse when I was much younger, and they told me I had scoliosis. Um, you know, patients may throughout their lives develop different types of back pain that may be related to the scoliosis here. Um, and it can be due to a number of things, whether it's more myofascial in nature, um, affecting your muscles and different fascia, or it can cause some um, arthritic joints in your back and your facet joints, or sometimes it can affect your nerves as well. Patients can also develop what's called degenerative scoliosis later in life. And sometimes due to wear and tear changes in your lumbar spine, you can develop a curvature that's not normal um, that can sometimes become symptomatic. Um, here in this picture, this um, Young lady has a scoliosis kind of more up in her thoracic spine, but the idea is the same that you can develop that in your lumbar spine as well. So when is a good time to go to the doctor's office for back pain? Um, when you have new low back pain symptoms that you didn't have before, or maybe you had a prior back issue and you're having a new flare up, um, maybe you had a recent injury with symptoms now affecting your back or your legs. And sometimes patients who have long-standing chronic back pain that has been progressively worsening over the recent years. And sometimes I see patients with a history of prior lumbar spine surgery who now develop new symptoms, whether it's pain, weakness, numbness down the leg, or any of the above. And so you can kind of see here, there's a lot of different reasons it might be helpful to be evaluated by a physician for back pain, as there can be a lot of different reasons that um, are your pain generators and what's contributing to your pain. And it's helpful to be assessed um, 
you know, for what may be causing your symptoms. So what exactly happens when you go to the doctor's office? Well, we all start off by taking a very thorough history, meaning we wanna find out more about what exactly are the symptoms you're experiencing. So number one, I like to know where exactly is the pain? Is it more in the middle of your back or is it off to one side or the other? Does it go down your leg or does it just stay right in the back? Are there particular things that make it worse or better? Are there known triggers where you're like, I know if I bend forward, it's going to make it worse, so I've been avoiding doing that. That's really helpful for me to know. Are you experiencing any weakness or numbness in your legs? Are you losing control of your bowel or bladder? And it also helps to know what type of uh, treatments or medications you might have tried so far for your symptoms and were they helpful? Other things I always ask when evaluating a patient um, are their prior medical uh, and surgical histories. I also ask about any current medications that you are taking. Next is a physical exam. I like to perform a very thorough neurological and musculoskeletal exam. And this looks at not only looking at your range of motion in your lumbar spine, um, but also testing your strength in your legs, your sensation in your legs, and sometimes your reflexes. I observe patients gait or how they walk. And a lot of these things all put together can give me an idea of where I think your pain is coming from. Is it more of a disc issue or is it one of those facet joints? Or am I suspecting something else like a radiculopathy or a pinched nerve going down your leg? There are also other provocative maneuvers, and that just means that there are certain tests that we do in part of our physical exam where I may lift your leg or ask you to walk you know, on your toes or on your heels, and that can help me um, further assess your neurological status, how strong or your motor strength in your legs, and see what I think your pain generator may be. Your initial workup may include some diagnostic tests, and these are some of the more common tests that I like to order. Um, an x-ray is really helpful, and on the right here are radiographs of the lumbar spine, and you can ignore all the words around there, but it helps give me an idea of what your bones look like, but it also tells me what maybe your discs look like as well, as the discs sit in between each of the bones there, um, and it gives me really good information um, sometimes an MRI or a CT scan may be indicated, and that gives just a higher bit definition of things that aren't seen on an x-ray, like your discs, your nerves, um, your soft tissue. CT scan gives us um, real high clarity on your exact bone structure um, and kind of more of like a three-dimensional view, which can also be helpful. Sometimes I order what's called electrodiagnostic studies um, or EMG or nerve conduction studies you may also see. That's a nerve test that can assess nerves along either your arms or your legs, um, wherever the test is ordered, to see if there's a problem with your nerves that may contribute to some of the symptoms you're experiencing. It can be really helpful in patients who may have a pinched nerve in their back um, or other nerve issues like peripheral neuropathy. And once in a while, I will order labs. And that's usually if I'm suspecting patients may have potential infections or high levels of inflammation that may contribute to their symptoms. Going into some of the treatment options here, there is a very broad spectrum of treatments that um, can be appropriate for different patients. And starting more conservatively on one end is physical therapy, including different modalities. There are additional treatment options I'll also get into, medications, and then kind of moving on to the more or less conservative treatment options would be things like interventional procedures and surgery, which is kind of the most extreme one-end option of treatment. And I'll go briefly through all of them and talk about when certain ones may be appropriate. Physical therapy. When I prescribe physical therapy, my main goal is to help patients find ways to get through their day-to-day -day life while minimizing their pain and maximizing their function. It helps me to know if there are certain things you wanna get into. For instance, this morning I had um, a patient who was super excited for the winter season coming up and he was like, 
you know, I really, my goal is to be able to go on the snowboarding trip, um, but I want to make sure my back is okay. And that's really helpful for me to know and the physical therapist. It's a nice goal to work towards um, and get you there safely. Other goals in therapy are to prevent injury or progression or recurrence of a certain injury. In the long run, physical therapy can help stabilize your lumbar spine. Um, and in the long run, that can really help either slow down progression of degenerative changes or help prevent you from re-injuring your back. I also like to include gentle range of motion for certain patients. And I think everyone can benefit from proper posture, uh, practice and exercises, proper biomechanics and an ergonomic evaluation. I think in this day and age with you know the post pandemic world where some of us are working from home or some hybrid mix of the two are now finally starting to get back to work in person. There's a lot of things that we probably aren't doing very appropriately or right with our ergonomics or posture. And I'm definitely guilty of that as well. And sometimes, you know, we spend a lot of our day at work and it's a huge chunk of our day and our time. And um, there may be things that you can improve on to reduce flaring up your symptoms um, and getting you through the day without being in so much pain. One of the most important parts about physical therapy is a home exercise program that they recommend. I never demand patients do, you know, you have to go to therapy three times a week with your physical therapist. Um, I think it's more important that you find a therapist you really click with, but that you see even once a week is okay. But the most important part is that you do the homework or the home exercise program they give you every day, a couple times a day, um, on the days that you don't see your physical therapist, because in the long run, that's really that lifestyle change that's going to prevent further injury in the future and help you really get the most out of what you're learning in physical therapy. Your initial evaluation with the physical therapist will likely take the whole hour that you see them for, and that helps them develop an individualized program that's very specific uh, for you. And generally a full course of physical therapy is about four to six weeks. A generic script might say twice weekly, but I really say anywhere from one to three times is appropriate. Um, in general, in my experience, I've noticed that it might take about a month for you to really know what you're doing with physical therapy and maybe another month after that to know if it's helping you. And it's because like any exercise, you don't pick it up right away and you do need a little bit of guidance and practice. And then it takes some time after that with repetitive um, exercise and doing some of these things at home on your own for your body to start making these changes. And so it takes some time to notice. Modalities, um, these are things that may be included in physical therapy sessions or things that you can also do at home on your own. And it includes things like applying heat or cold compresses. I don't have a preference on either as some patients find one superior than the other. Um, they, you can try it with a physical therapist or try it at home and see what works best for you. And in general, I say, leave whatever on for 20 minutes and then take off for another 20 minutes so that you don't risk developing you know, burns or developing a rash or anything like that. Sometimes a TENS unit can be helpful. And again, this is something that you can try with your physical therapist. Um, and sometimes a lumbar orthosis may be indicated and that's just basically a back brace like you see here in this picture. Back braces can be helpful in stabilizing your spine and providing a proprioceptive feedback for proper posturing um, and minimizing any unnecessary twisting forces or pressures on your back. Generally, I don't recommend back braces um, because it can, patients can become dependent on it and it can actually lead to further atrophy or weakening of some of your or muscles that help stabilize your spine. There are certain uh, indications or diagnoses where a back brace may be helpful, um, and that's really on a case-by-case -case basis. Patients, for instance, who have uh, compression fractures in their lumbar spine, I absolutely recommend bracing because they have a fracture that needs to be stabilized to heal. But all the other cases, it's uh, dependent on the patient and what they can tolerate. And so that's something that I don't really have a general recommendation for if it's not applicable to a vertebral compression fracture. Um, additional treatment options include things like acupuncture, 
um, which has been proven in research to be very helpful for things like myofascial uh, pain dysfunction. Osteopathic manipulative medicine, which is shown here on the right, um, I'm an osteopathic physician, I have a DO, and so that in osteopathic manipulative medicine entails a hands-on way to diagnose and treat patients with myofascial dysfunctions. Um, it's hard to explain without being there in person, but it can involve things like soft tissue manipulation, um, myofascial release, and sometimes a little bit more aggressive techniques like what we call high velocity, low amplitude maneuvers, which is kind of what you think of when you go to a chiropractor and they, you know, crack your back or something like that. Um, I unfortunately do not practice osteopathic manipulative medicine because it's been a number of years since I've done that, but we do have a number of providers here at Rothman who are osteopathic physicians who still practice this and they're incredible resources to have here um, in our department. Chiropractic treatment. Sometimes patients have good results with going to the chiropractor. Um, if it's helpful, then um, that's, you know, a great ad additional therapy to include in your whole regimen. Um, and in general, I say if it's a little bit, you know, more painful or causing you more discomfort, then maybe best to hold off on it until you're feeling better. Medications. Some of the common medications I may consider are things like anti-inflammatories, which include things like NSAIDs or sometimes steroids. Muscle relaxers can be helpful. Some examples here are cyclobenzaprine or tizanidine. And then we have neuropathic pain medications, things like gabapentin or pregabalin. I like to think of them as medications that can help turn down the volume on nerve irritation. Um, and some, you know, for some patients that may be really helpful. Sometimes tricyclic antidepressants can also be helpful in treating neuropathic pain. But again, that is on a case by case basis. There are other medications that I haven't mentioned here that may also be indicated in certain patients, um, but these are kind of the more common ones that I um, think can be helpful. And of course, they would depend on um, what your pain generator is as well. Going into the some of the less conservative treatment options, we have interventional procedures here. And these this may include things like epidural steroid injections, radiofrequency nerve ablation, there's a procedure called intracept, which is also the basal vertebral nerve ablation. And sometimes patients may benefit from a spinal cord stimulator or a spinal augmentation like vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty. These injections are all done under fluoroscopy, which means that they are x-ray guided. They're done in a room with a machine like this shown here on the right, where there's an x-ray machine that kind of swings over you and we take a lot of pictures to visualize exactly where we go. And some of these procedures may be indicated for certain patients um, for certain diagnoses, but not all. And so it can be, it's really helpful and important for a patient to be fully evaluated and diagnosed before jumping to any one of these interventional procedures. Um, some, you know, patients may not be appropriate to do um, epidural steroid injections. And there are other considerations that go into that, like their other past medical history or things like that. Um, and it really is on a case-by-case -case basis, but for a lot of patients, some of these procedures can be helpful um, if they've tried other conservative treatment options like physical therapy and medications and different modalities, and they find that they're just, you know, making some improvements and positive gains, but not quite where they want to be in order to do what they want to do. Um, and that's where some of these procedures can be really helpful. And so some of the questions down here, is this the right procedure for me? Well, I always wanna confirm the diagnosis with patients before recommending any procedure and then kind of seeing where their goals are and being realistic about the outcomes that we can get with certain procedures. I always talk, uh, educate or teach patients on any risks involved with these procedures and weighing that with potential benefits is really important. And at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that patients are making a well-informed decision about what procedure may be helpful for them. And sometimes I do send patients to some of our surgical colleagues. These may be patients who um, have symptoms and pain that's refractory to other treatment options that I've listed before this. It may also be indicated in patients who have new or worsening weakness 
Um, and I forgot to list here, also if they have new onset um, bowel bladder dysfunction or incontinence that is neurogenic in nature, um, there's lots of different types of incontinence. And I mentioned that because weakness or neurogenic bowel bladder can be signs of impending nerve injury or damage that is potentially irreversible. And so in these certain cases, it's imperative that we connect you to a surgical colleague um, to be evaluated and see if surgery can fix the underlying issue and alleviate your symptoms, but also prevent any potentially irreversible spinal cord or nerve damage. Um, sometimes patients do ask you all, you know, what does surgery entail? And I think that's a conversation best had with the surgeon because they'll be able to fully evaluate you and um, talk to you more about what your surgical options are and whether you are a good surgical candidate. Um, this is, I believe, yep, the end of my talk here. Um, I know that was a lot of information encompassing a lot of things, but I hope to do a brief overview, I guess, on some of the more common things I see. Um, so let me get to the Q&A section. Okay. All right, I'm gonna try to answer some of these um, in the order I got them in, in the best way I can. Okay, other than physical therapy, steroid injections, ablations, and surgery, what else can be done about SI joint pain? That's really tough sometimes. So true SI joint pain in my experience is um, not as common as you would think. And so making sure that you have an accurate diagnosis of SI joint dysfunction, I think is the most important thing. Um, I think that I've seen patients who are um, in the past maybe went down that path of being treated for SI joint pain and then um, maybe at some point their symptoms maybe have changed and it can be due to maybe more of a lumbar issue. Um, but beyond PT injections, ablations, and surgery, um, SI joint pain, it can be pretty tricky to treat and it can be more of like a functional balancing what you can handle doing and balancing that with medications. Um, but I would say definitely make sure that you're fully evaluated by a physician and maybe even a physical therapist to make sure that that is your true pain generator. Why does your low back pain radiate into the hips and down your legs? That's also a great question. Um, so there's a few different ways to answer that. There are what's called dermatomes, which are different patterns of sensation that go up and down your legs based on nerve roots. And that's all to say that you have lots of different nerves that come out of your lumbar spine and they kind of overlap in different ways as they go down your leg. And it can cause radiation of pain because those lumbar, um, I have like a spine model in this room, your lumbar nerve roots come out of your back, for instance, my water bottle. This is, imagine this is your lumbar spine. You have nerve roots that come out and these travel down your leg. And so sometimes when there's an issue at the source where your nerve root exits from your lumbar spine, that can cause irritation of that nerve going all the way down your leg. Sometimes um, that goes into your hips. Sometimes it goes down the back of your leg. Those are all really helpful things to know because that can give us a really good idea about which nerve level may be involved or whether it's coming from your lumbar spine at all. I hope that kind of was helpful. Okay, let me try to answer some of these other questions. Um, I'm going to just summarize some of these things. Is there a solution to degenerative disc disease on multiple levels and spinal stenosis? So there's not much that I can do as a physiatrist or a non-operative spine person to fix degenerative disc disease or spinal stenosis. Um, sometimes I say, you know, the only true fix for anything is surgery. And for a lot of patients, that's what we'll try to do to, you know, prevent you from getting to a point where you have to get surgery. Um, the best, I, I always tell patients the name of the game kind of from where you are today and going forward is to prevent your degenerative process from worsening and to maximize your function. And truly the best way to do that is to, um, get started in physical therapy to really work on stabilizing your spine 
and creating a strong core foundation because when you strengthen all those different layers of core muscles surrounding your entire spine, you take a lot of load and pressure off your spine so that when you are doing your day-to-day -day activities, you're putting less forces and pressures on your discs themselves, but also some of those facet joints and other structures around your spine. Um, sometimes injections and things like that can be helpful to take the edge off or take the pain away so that you can continue working on strengthening your core foundation. But sometimes if some of these treatment options aren't helpful, that's where we may consider, you know, maybe appropriate to talk to a surgeon and get an opinion and see what your options are and see what your realistic outcomes may be from that. When we ask the primary doctor for a referral to be seen by you, what specialty to ask for? Also a good question. Um, so here at Rothman, I'm part of the Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Department or PMNR. Um, you can also maybe ask for a non-operative spine um, and that would also probably get towards me or to me or someone on my team. What are the side effects of drugs like gabapentin, if any? Um, that's a really common question I get when I um, recommend gabapentin to patients. And that's a very appropriate question um, because there are a lot of warnings that come with gabapentin that may scare some patients, which is valid. Um, kind of going to the history, gabapentin was designed like years and years and years ago as an anti-epileptic drug, uh, which is an anti-seizure drug. And they realized that it didn't do a great job at preventing seizures, but they found that patients who took gabapentin um, had improvement in neuropathic pain or pain coming from nerve irritation. And so that's what it's primarily used for now. Nobody uses it for preventing seizures because there's a lot of other drugs that are way better at, at that now. Gabapentin is a medication best taken consistently every day. It's not like Tylenol or Motrin where you take here and there because it needs to build a steady state in your body to become effective. It takes about a week or so for your body to adjust. And during that time period, patients may find that they are drowsy or a little bit groggy. There's ways to kind of mitigate or go around that. Um, and a lot of times I'll recommend patients to take it only at nighttime for a week or so, so that your body adjusts. And if you do happen to be one of those few people who experience drowsiness or grogginess, you'll already be sleeping. And hopefully by the morning or the daytime, you won't be affected. There's plenty of room to go up on that dose later, but that's kind of the way I go around that. Uh, all right, next question. Sorry, where did my window go? Can one assume that different docs will come to a similar diagnosis after a complete assessment? Um, I certainly hope so. Um, the way we perform our physical exam is pretty standardized, um, it, very standardized actually. There's a series of things that all physiatrists will do in their exam, which entails the things I mentioned, as well as going over your x-ray or other advanced imaging. Um, I can't speak for all doctors, but just my experience here at Rossman and some of the other institutions I've been at, um, it has been very consistent. Are there a lot of questions here? Let me, uh, oh, discs in the lower lumbar, how can you make them stronger? So discs themselves, um, not really any ways to make them stronger once they started degenerating or having wear and tear changes in them. And it's gonna happen to all of us. As we age, um, all of us, our discs will bear some of the brunt of our day-to-day -day lives and they'll start to show some wear and tear and that's just normal aging. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of things to make them stronger, um, but that's where physical therapy is so important in that you strengthen all the stuff and structures around it, like your muscles and your core, so that you take some of the pressure off your discs um, and help do the work of your day-to-day, -day, you know, when you're bending forward, lifting things, whatever you do. Um, so that it takes a lot of pressure off of them. Um, this is kind of like a personal bit, but I had um, my own bit with back pain last year and I went through a whole course of physical therapy um, and there's not much to do to strengthen your spine itself. Um, but 
working to strengthen, you know, my core and things like that, I will say it took about three, four months, but it's a slow improvement and it can really help in taking some of the pressure off your disc. And that's kind of my experience with that as well. And I'm always happy to talk to patients. I always say there's like method actors and I can be a method patient now because I've gone through some of the process. Um, I'm always happy to talk about that. Um, please show the first slide again. I will try to, oh, let me see if I can do that here. First slide. Oh no, where did we go? First slide, the two views of the spine. I think it's this one that they're asking for. I'll leave this up here um, just for people to review. What is the most effective treatment for low back pain caused by osteoporosis and arthritis? Um, osteoporosis um, is more of a bone mineral density, um, I guess, issue. Um, and that itself doesn't cause back pain. Um, sometimes arthritis in different joints in your back can be a pain generator in your back. Um, and the treatment for both of those, sorry, dog is, all right, hi buddy. Um, the treatment for those two are, are pretty different. So patients um, who are at risk of developing osteoporosis, not quite having osteoporosis, um, they may benefit from light weight or resistance-based training to prevent osteoporosis later in life. But I think that's a conversation best had with either your primary care physician or an endocrinologist. Um, arthritis, it's hard to say that there's one specific treatment that's the most effective, but the primary way I do think that'll keep patients out of the woodwork in the long run and set you up for success in the long run is through physical therapy. Sorry, my dog is very emotionally needy and he's crying. Um, what about chronic gluteal pain? Can the origin of that be the spine? Again, there are a lot of different ways that lumbar um, issues can cause radiation of pain. And I think that's one of those instances where being evaluated and examined by a physician in person can be very helpful in um, de determining what your pain generator is. What is the difference between diagnostic block and a steroid injection. Yeah, so a steroid injection, or sometimes patients refer to that as a cortisone shot, um, and that would be like an epidural steroid injection. That's when um, a small amount of steroid is injected into the epidural space um, to help decrease inflammation of a nerve that may be irritated. A diagnostic block, um, assuming this is referring to what's called like a medial branch block, is a diagnostic injection where just lidocaine and not steroid typically is injected to see if it can help identify a pain generator. And this can be helpful for um, patients who may be a candidate for the radiofrequency nerve ablation. And that's a whole process that I like to have a lengthy conversation with patients because not everyone is a good candidate for a ner radiofrequency nerve ablation. Um, and because it's a slightly different procedure, there are some diagnostic block injections that are involved before a patient is deemed, you know, an appropriate or not an appropriate candidate for uh, an ablation. Will drugs cure neuropathy? So drugs do not cure neuropathy, but they can help diminish some of the symptoms you may feel from it from neuropathy, like gabapentin, it can help like turn down the volume on some of that nerve irritation is how I like to think of it as. But there are like dozens of causes of neuropathy um, and sometimes treating the underlying cause of that neuropathy can be very helpful. For instance, I see a lot of patients who have diabetic or diabetes induced neuropathy and patients who have better uh, blood sugar control, their symptoms of neuropathy will improve. Um, and so that's just one of the examples. Is it possible for surgery to cause irreversible nerve pain? Um, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that. I think it will really depend on what type of surgery you had. And it might be a good conversation to have with your surgeon who may know the ins and outs of what was involved with surgery. 
um, and potential complications that may arise from it. But um, I think I'll kind of leave it at that because it's not really my area of expertise. How does weight exercise on my legs help my nerves flare up? So um, maybe not quite like weight exercise, um, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes there are exercises in physical therapy that the therapist will teach you when you come in with like nerve pain shooting down your leg. And sometimes they involve weights, sometimes they don't, but there are certain exercises like nerve glides, um, which are different maneuvers and exercises that can help decrease some of that tension and irritation on your nerve roots coming from your back. And that can help decrease nerve pain in um, physical therapy. Um, I think that's maybe what this question is referring to, um, but there's a lot of different exercises that can help what I like to call like centralized pain or decrease some of that nerve irritation that may be radiating or shooting down uh, into your leg. How frequent can uh, an epidural steroid injection, can someone get an epidural steroid injection or their potential negative? Yeah, so in general, um, for let's say a healthy patient who doesn't have a lot of other medical issues, um, I would say, um, I would recommend no more than three epidural steroid injections in a 12 month period or one year. And that's because we want to avoid repeating epidural steroid injections too much where patients may start feeling any potential negative side effects from them. And um, steroid injections and in, like epidural steroid injections like any other steroids can affect a number of things. It can increase your blood sugar, um, which is a consideration for patients who are diabetic. It can affect your adrenal glands. It can affect your bone health. And especially in patients who are osteoporotic or who have osteoporosis, I'm pretty conservative in how many um, steroid injections that I give patients with documented and known osteoporosis um, seen on a DEXA scan. Um, and that's very specific, um, but there are a lot of different considerations. But in general, I would say the short answer is probably three, within, three or four within a calendar year. Okay. Okay, so there are other comments here. Could yoga or simil similar workouts help strengthen the back? Yes, um, that's a great question. Um, as someone who, like, I love doing yoga, I think it's a great exercise. Um, it can certainly help strengthen the back in yoga or even things like Pilates, like, it's definitely not easy. Um, I would say, though, if you're in an acute flare up, meaning like you're back pain just like came up and it's, you know, hitting you pretty strong and you're not where you normally are. Um, that's another instance where I turn to my physical therapy, therapy colleagues who can um, examine and observe you in a nice structured environment and find ways for you to be able to participate or do yoga or go back to whatever, you know, exercise classes you have in a safe way that doesn't put you at risk of injuring yourself further or causing new problems. Um, but in the absence of any, um, you know, acute issues, I absolutely think yoga is a great workout. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Okay. Are there any other questions? Well, if there aren't, um, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about something that I love seeing patients for every day. Um, I guess like bottom line is I love getting people back to things that they enjoy doing. And that's kind of the whole reason I got into physical medicine and rehab. And so I'm happy to answer some of these questions here. And I think other questions may be best suited, maybe more personally with, directly with the provider. Um, but I'll turn things over to Natalie now. Thank you, Dr. Song. That was great. And Thank you everyone for your very insightful questions. A few um, questions or concerns that come through about if this will be sent out as a recording. So it will, I did tell the few couple people who asked, uh, we did record this. I will send it out to everyone who was on um, tonight and anyone who registered but couldn't make it probably by early next week. So keep a lookout for that. 
Also, if you are interested in scheduling an appointment with Dr. Song or um, with a different specialist at Rothman, um, you, you all have my email. You can uh, feel free to email me directly and I'm happy to help you uh, get set up with an appointment. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Dr. Song. Great presentation. Uh, happy early Thanksgiving to everyone. I hope you enjoy your holiday um, and have a great night. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.